Welcome to Electro Online. Here's a quick overview of how to solve projectile motion problems. Now, this is an idea that came from my wife because when she was a student, she was actually a much better student than I was. And she had this technique of how to solve problems and how to quickly review the problems that she kind of already knew from previous studies. So what she does is she takes each problem one at a time and quickly reviews how to do it and then she moves on to the next one. She doesn't do any of the algebra at that point because the algebra at that point should be easy to solve. So here we have four straightforward simple type of projectile problems. On part two we'll show the more complex type of projectile problems. But they all have a similar commonality and it's good to see the commonality between them. All four of them are projectiles either dropped are thrown from a building 50 meters high and typically the kind of questions we want to answer is how far did it go before it landed and what was the velocity when it landed. Now it turns out that when we have an object that we simply drop from the top or that we throw horizontally out the time in the air will be exactly the same because only the y component no matter which problem we're looking at is the only component of the velocity that controls the time in the air which then controls how far something will go and how fast it will move when it finally arrives on the ground now notice here we have these four equations these are the four equations you're going to use for just about every one of these projectile problems these are the equations of motion in the y direction and this is the first equation for the x direction because in the x direction we do not have an acceleration we only have an acceleration in the y direction and we can always assume that the initial position is zero in the x direction so how do we find time in the air we use the first equation we plug in the final height the initial height the initial velocity in the y direction and one half times g g is a minus 9.8 meters per second squared so we put in a minus 4.9 solve for time once you have the time, you can then solve for the velocity at the end when it reaches the ground. We use the second equation, initial velocity in the y direction plus g times t. Remember g is a minus 9.8. You plug in this time over here and you get the final velocity. What's different in the second problem? There we have an initial horizontal velocity, because, but time in the air will be exactly the same. We use the exact same process to find time in the air. The final velocity will now have two components. We have the y component, which will be exactly the same as what we have over here. But for the x component, notice that the final velocity in the x direction is equal to the initial velocity in the x direction, and therefore it remains at 20 meters per second because that was the initial velocity. To find the final velocity, we use Pythagorean theorem. It's the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. And to find the angle at which it lands, we take the inverse tangent of the ratio of the x and the y components. If we throw the object upward, now notice we'll have an initial velocity in the x direction and an initial velocity in the y direction. The initial velocity in the y direction is positive because it's upward. Time in the air, we use the same technique, but now notice we have a middle term. We have an initial velocity in the y direction, which we did not have over here. It is positive because it's upward. So now this is what the equation looks like, exactly the same as before, but now we have an initial velocity in the y direction, which can be found by taking the initial velocity times the sine of the angle. The initial velocity in the x direction will be the initial velocity times the cosine of that angle. The final velocity in the x direction, same as the initial velocity in the x direction, will be 17.32 meters per second. It's 20 times the cosine of 30. And to find the final velocity in the y direction, notice we use the exact same equation as before. It's this equation right here. But notice now we have an initial velocity in the y direction, which is positive, and a minus gt, or minus 9.8 times the time. We now take the time over here. And how far did we go? We simply multiply the initial velocity in the x direction times the time of the air to get the distance that the projectile traveled. Over here, now we're throwing it downward. So what's the difference between these two? The only difference is that the initial velocity in the y direction is now negative instead of positive. Notice it's now going to be a negative 10 meters per second, which is the initial velocity, which I guess I didn't write it down. I should probably write it down as 20 meters per second and the angle at 30 degrees. So that means that in the y direction, it's minus 10 meters per second squared. So the only difference is this is a plus 10, that's a minus 10. Everything else looks exactly the same. You now have a new time in the air, 
and then to solve for vf in the y direction. The only difference there is that this is going to be a negative 10 instead of a positive 10. Different time in the air and for the distance traveled again initial velocity in the x direction which again will be a 17.32 meters per second because it's, it's v initial times the cosine of 30 and times time in the air which in this case will be only 2.33 seconds and it's not going to go as far. So if you can see how these are tied together, how common they are, how similar they are in the approach, you can then have a very good basis on which to build on your understanding of projectile motion. We will now show part two uh, where we show different kinds of examples where I have projectiles going like this from the ground or from some initial height need to clear walls and that kind of thing. So we'll show you how to do those general types of problems, but they'll be very similar to what we just saw. And that is how it's done.